busy week in politics draws to a close. We are heading into a weekend marking just three weeks since that news broke that Kamala Harris was entering the presidential race when Joe Biden exited, driving headlines that shifted from all that Democratic panic and infighting to a kind of sheer party exuberance. Her campaign's been achieving a lot in these three weeks, reshaping the race into a contrast between the familiar and unpopular Donald Trump, who often looks like he's doing the political equivalent of airing reruns from seasons past, a contrast between that and this newer face for many voters, especially the non-news junkies, Kamala Harris. And even Donald Trump's reruns seem lower energy right now. He's holding far fewer rallies than past campaigns, doing less than half of the rallies he did in a similar stretch in the summer of 16. And while Democrats are all in on this new race, embracing Harris with the donations and the memes and the big crowds, Trump seems stuck in the matchup that is now over, fixating on the history of his duel with Biden. Now, Trump addressed reporters yesterday in a kind of attempt to shake up a week that has seen Harris dominating and really dominating the news cycles and the message. But then during that set of remarks, he ended up talking about Biden again and adopting a stance that even his supporters probably do not buy, do not believe. Trump trying to express a narrative where he says he feels bad for how Biden was treated and left the race. Quote, the presidency was taken away from Joe Biden. He had a rough debate, but that doesn't mean you just take it away like that, Trump said yesterday. And the delegates have already formally voted to make Harris the nominee, but Trump's been posting online about how he kind of imagines or wishes that President Biden could still somehow come back and be his Democratic opponent again this year. And that's been driving headlines about how Trump can't get over this. And does anyone miss Biden as much as Trump? That's how The New Yorker is raising the question today, noting how for 18 days Trump has refused to let go of his grief alternating between anger and denial at the loss of his favorite target. Clearly freaked out by Harris's rise in the polls, Trump all but demanded Biden return to the race. Now look, these are not the headlines that Trump's campaign team wants. They do not make Trump look strong. They do not offer voters anything. These aren't headlines about your life or the choice in November or policies, obviously. And these headlines don't even address Trump's current opponent. And, of course, in a campaign, you have to deal with the current opponent, not the one you wish you still had. This is Trump's opponent. Now, Trump lost his presidency to Biden, the defining rejection of his single term and political life. And he thought he could beat Biden this time. And he was not alone. Many Democrats saw the same prospect. And now Trump has lost in a different way. He's lost his rematch. He's lost his chance at political revenge. And if he does lose to Harris, he has lost the opponent he might have beaten. Trump is fixated on Biden for all those reasons. He seems upset, undisciplined, and unable to move on. He is hung up on this figure from the past. Trump verging on his own Costanza moment from Seinfeld, living in the past. Forget me for you should forget it. You're living in the past, man. You hung up on some clown from the 60s, man. It's hard to live in the past. Most campaigns are about the future. Harrison Walls are making the case against going back. You've probably heard that mantra. Today they're campaigning in the battleground of Arizona. And we can see already, as we've been monitoring it, this is one of those time lapses of the very, very long lines of people waiting to see this new ticket. We should note it's over 100 degrees there, and people are queued up and waiting and waiting and waiting to get in to see it. Arizona is one of the places Trump lost to Biden when Fox News called the state for Biden. All heck broke loose at Trump's campaign. Harris has also released a new ad linking her middle class story to Americans' priorities in the future of housing, prices, and health care. She grew up in a middle class home. She was the daughter of a working mom. And she worked at McDonald's while she got her degree. Kamala Harris knows what it's like to be middle class. It's why she's determined to lower health care costs and make housing more affordable. Donald Trump has no plan. Those are the Harris campaign's priorities, talking to voters about policies in their own future. Where is Donald Trump tonight? Montana. Kind of a curious call. It's another day where Donald Trump is not in a battleground state. 
as he also holds fewer rallies, as I showed you. Trump's there to link up with a Republican Senate candidate. So this is the contrast. Some of it is kind of permanent or unshakable. There are things people already know about Donald Trump and his policies and his style, and there are things that the Democrats, first under Biden and now under Harris, are offering. There is a policy consistency. But the new contrast from Harris to Trump is clearly so different and so much scarier for Trump that he hasn't really fully absorbed it yet, and he's living in the past, exactly as that clown told George Costanza not to do. Now, the Democrats' recent past involves Kamala Harris evolving into the role she is holding today, where people feel that as vice president, she's got some real governing experience. And as a candidate, she is more experienced and polished than the last time that she's run for national office. So you think about the DNC, here was Harris at the last convention when she was the VP nominee. My mother taught me that service to others gives life purpose and meaning. And oh, how I wish she were here tonight, but I know she's looking down on me from above. She probably could have never imagined that I would be standing before you now and speaking these words. I accept your nomination for Vice President of the United States of America. We will hear something similar at the next convention, but maybe with more applause if it's not a COVID festivity. We're joined, as you see, by Juanita Tolliver, MSNBC analyst, author of the forthcoming book, A More Perfect Party, and I, Shirley Chisholm, and Diana Carroll reshaped politics. You can actually get that on pre-order now, and why not? <laughs> Eleanor Clift, a writer with The Daily Beast, her latest, Tim Walls versus J.D. Vance, The Battle of the Veeps, and Vibes is on. Uh, welcome to both of you. Thanks, Ari. Uh, Thanks Eleanor? The past is something to know and learn from, but not always to live in. Right. Um, what do you think of this contrast in the way that Donald Trump, um, he lies a lot, we've covered that, we fact-checked that, but he also sometimes emotionally blurts what he's feeling, and he seems to right. feel that he doesn't want to deal with running against what may be a harder opponent. He feels aggrieved, cheated. He was, he was supposed to run against Biden. Now he's going to run against somebody else. He hardly knows her, but she's, of course, incompetent. And he is suggesting that there was some constitutional funny business that really she has no right to be occupying this position. So he's always sort of, you know, it sounds kind of unhinged, but he's always salting the water for uh, arguments that he's going to uh, make uh, later on. And uh, he, he does not know how to run in any other way than he being aggrieved. You know, first the courts were getting him. You know, now the country has... Uh, confused him because he has a different opponent. He has to start all over. The thing is that after a while, people want to hear what this election means for them. They're tired of hearing about him. And you're right about the rallies. People are leaving early. He keeps them waiting for an hour and a half in 90-degree heat. And then he goes on for an hour and a half and says some of the most absurd things. In his press conference yesterday, he's talking about taking on Martin Luther King, Jr., mm -hmm saying that uh, his Trump's rallies actually have gotten more people than King did. King got 250,000 people in a country that was a whole lot smaller than it is than it is today. Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm waiting to see what the Republicans have. I think this the the rap on uh, Waltz that he uh, you know got got out of the of the, the reserves because he didn't want to go to Iraq. He's fought that back before. I mean, and I don't think people are in a mood for this. Just because these attacks worked in the past <laughs> doesn't mean they're going to work this time. And the liberal uh, agenda that he's supposedly, supposedly so radical, you go one by one, it's most things that poll uh, very popularly and that most Yo. people would like, like child care, lunches that don't discriminate against the poor kids who have to identify themselves as poor. So, I mean, I... Everything is so good right now, I almost don't want to jinx it. <laughs> so um, I'm, I'm going to go with the joy. But um, like Reagan once said, trust but verify. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of hard work ahead. Right. And the fact that there's more enthusiasm than there was is an emotion and it's a start. Campaigns have to end. And there's a lot of voter turnout, right. in some cases registration, and other right. work to be done. And that's, that's true no matter what happens. Juanita, we see the 
Warning signals, though, are also coming from the right. Uh, the Wall Street Journal is part of Rupert Murdoch's media empire, shared with Fox. Uh, they have this piece saying Trump might blow another election, saying in public what privates have been, what, what I should say, uh, Republicans have been lamenting in private. They say Trump's lost a step, basically. The long speeches Eleanor just mentioned that become a, quote, bundle of personal grievances and impulsive floundering. He lacks any consistent message. And they say it's not only that he could blow the election, it could also hurt other Republican candidates. Honestly, I'm saying welcome to reality, because this has been the case for years. Mm. Donald Trump is doing this. And, and when you were doing your intro about Trump being upset about Kamala Harris as his opponent, I was thinking of Lil Wayne, show me my opponent. Mm. And Harris and Walls are saying, hi, we're here, and we are ready to dominate this race. And we're seeing that by the line you showed in Arizona in 105 degree heat, people lined up, but also the people who are ready to do the work for the campaign. I'm talking about the donations, which have been historic, and two thirds from first time donors. I'm talking about 200,000 new volunteers have signed up for this campaign. They are ready to knock on the doors. They are ready to make the phone calls. They are ready to contact the voters. All based on their motivation or hope, as I think you're alluding to, right. that is presented with this new ticket and the way that Harris and Walls campaign together in a joyous way in direct contrast to the ramblings that right. make you question what is actually happening in Donald Trump's mind. Or, as he announced um, recently, he's not campaigning again until after the DNC. Then you have the Harris-Walls campaign saying, go ahead and get your rest, old man. Yeah, get your rest. We know you don't care Take about anything time. or anybody except for playing <laughs> golf, so go rest. We